it a fundamental mistake to think that the world and consciousness are purely material? Is it possible for fact-checking to be impartial? What makes a scientific theory successful? That should be the common ground here. Just a small correction. Yeah. You said, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Be sure I will correct you even if you are right. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> famous philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce, American philosopher um, at the end of the 19th century, yeah. said that it was a mistake to try to define truth, but you could define the search for truth, which was the search for a point beyond which a question is settled, a, a point beyond which doubt does not arise. Now, in the case of ethics, I think there are plenty of points beyond which doubt does not arise. Uh, if, if I ask for a show of hands, how many people in this audience think that it's wrong to stamp on blind babies for fun? <laughs> how, how many p people think it's okay to stamp on blind babies for fun? There's only about three what? people put their hands up. <laughs> 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 okay, so there's, a, there's something which is done and dusted. It's beyond discussion. Uh, to use a famous phrase of the philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe, if somebody chooses to dissent from it, he shows a corrupt mind, and I have no interest in arguing with him. In other words, it's something which, at, for the moment, the ground stands firm. That's where we are. And then you can go on and see if we can formalize things, make more abstract propositions about morality, and so on. And that always proves very difficult. But um, the basic judgments from which we start, you've got to start in medias res, in the middle of things, and those basic judgments from which we start, like the one I mentioned, those stand firm. Those are done and dusted. They're part, we can even talk about knowledge if we wish, and where we talk about knowledge, we can talk about objective knowledge, the same thing. So I think the, um, the polarized debate, which um, Joanna talked about between relativists on the one hand and the uh, madmen on the other, the fanatics and the um, uh, the totalitarians. Um, that can be put behind us. We've got to look for more nuanced issues within the general sphere of the things we know and the things we are pretty certain of. And then we can perhaps progress. If you start with the abstract ideas of objectivity and subjectivity, you'll get nowhere. On that note, Slavoj, do you want to tell us whether objective morality is possible, not in a yeah. third world sense? Yeah. But I in, still yeah. will like, I don't know what's happening with me. Usually I'm just butchering around. Now I'm in a better mood and I try to find common language. And I still think there is not a big difference between the two of us. Yes, I agree with you. What you it ultimately, in some sense, of course, morality expresses our stances. But I would say, if you permit me using one of m old examples of mine, that there has to be a minimum of, I'm very anti-Marxist here, Marxists usually attack, uh, you know, alienation. I think there should be a minimum of alienation here that I don't present it just as my expression. That's why, here comes my old example, phenomena which always interested me are this phenomena, the first known example was, and I visited them in south of Greece, uh, so-called weepers. Women whom you pay to cry for you, to do the mourning for you. People would say, oh, how hypocritical and so on. No, I think this is a positive phenomenon. It gives you a minimum of distance. You minimally objectivize your stance. The same, I would say, goes, now you will say, but this goes for primitive cultures like, you know, in uh, ancient China, uh, in Tibet, those prayers. I love this idea. You put your prayer on a paper, you put the paper in a meal, 
uh, will you turn it around and to put it in Stalinist terms, objectively you are praying, even if your mind is on sex or whatever. But now you will say this goes for primitive cultures, AAA. Look at the greatest contribution for me of American culture in the 20th century. It was so-called canned laughter, you remember it, where laughter is part of the screen. It worked with me. I often uh, uh, came home in the evening tired as a dog. I put some stupid series on Cheers Friends and I didn't laugh uh, just like this. But at the end I felt released as if I laughed. <laughs> and I think I don't want to dismiss this as I know our Marxist friend will say extreme commodification, racification. No, there has to be this minimum of ritualistic alienation. You do a ritual. And I think it was shown, I will not take too much time very briefly, it, our reaction to pandemic, how this proper level of minimally objectified mourning didn't function and it was mostly limited precisely on these hysterical outbursts on, of course, on Twitter, on Facebook and so on and so on. So I think consciousness is um, quite a funny word in some ways. Um, and I, I want to talk about something that is possibly more tangible but relates to consciousness. So if we think of morality, for example, it's a very complex behaviour that relates to us as individuals and how we integrate ourselves within the outer world. So when we study morality as neuroscientists, what we can see is that there's particular regions, particular circuits within the brain that give rise to our moral behaviour. And that our genes, the d DNA that we're given from our mum and our dad, impinge and underpin our moral code as an individual. But we can also see that there's quite a lot of different effects from the environment around us that can affect how we morally behave with each other. So, for example, there's moral contagion. If I'm in a group of people, and these people have different moral codes, different mor moral values to me, then without me being consciously aware of it, without me realising, I will naturally start to veer my moral code and transgress or in increase my moral code more towards theirs. And there's something really interesting that happens within our brains as our moral codes, as our moral values get shifted. There's different changes within the striatum, which is a brain region that's involved in reward and motivation, which means that once you've devalued your moral code and you're transgressing, then actually your brain gets primed towards further transgression and to receive more reward from further transgression. Um, so this is a really complex aspect of our consciousness, a very complex behavioural phenotype of morality. But as neuroscientists start to understand it a little bit more, it's also posing philosophical questions such as, should we be all taking moral enhancement agents? So agents that would help us to um, increase our moral values and increase our ability to have altruism and compassion towards other people and possibly elevate our consciousness. So I want to start the discussion with consciousness by actually reducing it to a really complex behaviour of morality. Consciousness is actually the only thing that we understand. We inhabit it, we know it intimately, and in that Descartes was right that it is the one thing we cannot deny. Matter, however, is a concept that has been created by our conscious minds. We know it only as something that we experience in consciousness. And it's a construct which is very difficult to explain. It seems to denote a category of things in consciousness that resist, that resist my will. Of course, when you've got things that don't uh, easily go together, one strategy is just to deny that one of the other one of the other parties that seem to conflict exists, and this would be the position of certain sort of philosophers, rather like the Churchlands. And I, I call this the Putin gambit. You know, opposition. What opposition? And um, I don't think it works. And uh, there are people, of course, like 
Nick Humphreys, who will be talking about his, his view, that consciousness is an illusion. It's an intriguing idea, but there is a problem with that. It, illusion already suggests consciousness. It begs the ground of what it's already talking about. Oh, good, there's already an argument. I'll let you finish. And then... Carry on. So really, essentially, what one needs to be looking at is, is this consciousness something completely distinct from matter that supervenes? And some people have suggested that it does at a certain point in evolution. And their explanations are often intriguing and complicated, but ultimately unconvincing. They boil down to a kind of hand-waving where one gestures towards some kind of complexity or some kind of um, transformation that occurs mysteriously at this point. I prefer the idea, which seems to me the most logical position, that if consciousness is associated with matter, it doesn't happen at a certain point but must be there at some level or in some degree in the business that makes up the universe. And this is a position that's been reached by a number of the analytic philosophers of the Western tradition recently, including Galen Strawson in England and Christian de Quincey in America. And essentially their position is that this is the most rational possible way of thinking about consciousness. It doesn't tell us what it is, however. It only suggests a way of thinking about it. My own view is that matter is probably a phase of consciousness, and I'm using the word phase in the way that chemists and physicists use it in talking about the phases of water. It can be vaporous, it can be flowing when it's uh, liquid water, and it can be solid when it's ice. And it may be some sort of congelate of consciousness. But what consciousness is, I rather think we won't crack. Uh, I, l I like the remark, no doubt apocryphal, or at least anonymous, that if our brains were simple enough for us to understand them, we wouldn't be able to understand. I think fundamentally we, we need a strategy which, as you said, raises the living standards of all of us and creates a society, famously derided by Margaret Thatcher in her terrible statement, there is no such thing as society. And one of the worst aspects of rentier capitalism has been, over the last 40 years, the systematic plundering of our commons, those things that belong to all of us, the public amenities, the public services, the public infrastructure, that provide an informal fabric, the poor man's overcoat it's sometimes called, that actually helps make society. One of the symbolic things that Thatcher did when she became Prime Minister was sell off the school playgrounds of our state schools and turn it into a profit-making entity. In the austerity era, we had a situation where we were closing thousands of libraries, public libraries, to save public money because of the low taxes that were creating a budget deficit and they had to try and make savings. You will see the same thing now with cuts on public spending because they've done the tax cuts they've just done. We've got to square the circle so we've got to get the budget deficit down so we're cutting public spending. If you do that, you deprive your parks of maintenance, you deprive your amenities, you privatised your streets and squares. All of this is part of the agenda of privatization. And in privatizing, you deprive society of your social fabric. Um, in the fake capitalism world, in rigor mortis world, you will, and you will have come across this a lot, I'm sure, in uh, 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 the media and other things you may have been reading, uh, markets are, as it were, ends in themselves. They're just valuable. You must have things put into a market. Um, markets are subject to, are best understood as, uh, in terms of their freedom or non-freedom. What you want is the freest possible markets. Freedom is understood as the absence of impediment. Free markets are markets that are characterized in the economist's understanding by perfectly, by perfect information, all the information available 
is, as it were, in the price of whatever the good is. Um, by perfect rationality, all the agents involved um, are, extreme, are, are perfectly rational about their own best interests, um, and also uh, perfect competition. So everyone, all these agents are competing with each other in an entirely frictionless way that just gives them uh, maximum uh, opportunity to compete. Okay, so I, I think that's a deeply corrupting picture um, in all kinds of different ways. Um, and there are two or three things that point just to notice about it. The first is um, that it analogizes everything to certain kinds of financial markets. So it kind of builds in a mild preference in favor of financial markets. The second is that it, it has an, a, a notion of group psychology which translates into a notion of individual psychology on which individuals are basically economic automata who are purely motivated by the desire for gain or the avoidance of loss. Okay, and the third thing is that when that's taken into uh, uh, into and that's two further effects. When that's that idea is taken into government, what you get is a uh, very centralising government, because it starts to come to see, seem to people in positions of authority as though the only thing that matters is whether or not a particular group in society has had their own economic incentives appropriately tweaked through the tax and benefit system. So the desire is, well, we'll extend the tax and benefit system to everyone, and then if there's a particular group that isn't being, as it were, brought into the system, given the right economic incentives, those are supposed to be the only incentives that matter, we'll just tweak the tax and benefit system. And so you see these arguments for people for tax advantaging marriage or for changing the tax treatment of um, single mothers. Or, you know, you can see how this kind of thing ramifies itself. And the result of that is a hideously complex tax and benefit system, which, you know, very, very uh, expert people struggle to understand. If you're interested in, this, in, the, in the, uh, uh, the rule, uh, the benefits handbook, which is the kind of standard thing, uh, uh, has increased from about that big 10 years ago to about that big. Um, the Tollies manuals of our tax law are greater than they ever have been. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a form of insanity. Um, and uh, we lack the rabbinical scrutiny in the tax system in our politicians to allow us to understand how these things might work. And actually, people don't understand it themselves. And so, of course, their own behavior isn't, is hardly suitable. If you can't understand something, it's hard to have, have, have your own behavior really uh, affected by it. An effective theory is based on the idea that at any given time, we've measured certain things in a certain regime of parameters, maybe a certain distance regime, a certain energy regime, a certain um, whatever uh, size regime. Um, and we can make predictions, we can make successful predictions, we can have theories about that regime of parameters. Now, mind you, that regime of parameters becomes bigger and bigger as we expand our measurements, as we look at more things. But we have this very, and, and those answers are correct, up to the accuracy with which we've measured things. So it could be that either by measuring things more accurately or by moving to a different regime, we can find that our predictions were not absolute, as you put it. They're not precise, but they were precise enough for everything we had to do, precise enough to send a man to the moon, but maybe it could get more precise and that would be irrelevant to anything we see today, which is why we're not, we haven't measured that yet. Now that, so I think it's very comforting and very comfortable and helps get around a lot of these silly debates to admit that that's the way all knowledge works. We base it on what we've seen, what we've observed. We put it together into theories. We can make predictions. Uh, science is unique in that we can usually say the accuracy with which we trust the predictions and then allow things to evolve beyond that. So to say there's an absolute is unnecessary in all of this. We don't even have to ask that question. We, all we have to do is ask the question, is it, is it good enough for what we're trying to do in whatever we're trying to predict, whatever we're trying to build? And that's the sense in which science is brilliantly successful. And it's also brilliantly successful in telling us when we don't have absolute things. I mean, what we're doing in particle physics is we're looking for deviations from this, what we call the standard model. That's what tells us how to go beyond. It doesn't mean the standard model is wrong. It tells us that there could be a richer structure that underlies it. And that's the way science can evolve. Uh, we have a theoretical framework that we are incredibly confident works for our own solar system, even up to our own galaxy. So one of the core tenets of the standard model of cosmology that we have, and that has led to this whole Big Bang cosmology and all the, uh, all the ideas around it, is based on the implication that what we know of our own solar system is valid universally.
across. There are certain base, uh, like certain constants that we just assume to be this. We assume the universe to be the same in all directions. We assume gravity to work the same everywhere. And so one of the interesting things about how Mond enters the scene is that this is based on observations that show actually gravity is not the same everywhere. Gravity is actually variable in certain places. Now what to do with that? The, so what we are discussing with dark matter, dark energy, these things are, they all come about uh, because we have just assumed at the core that we have a, have a theory that works for the entire universe. Bjorn, from a philosophical background, do you think that these ma this matters, so how we understand how gravity works and, and whether the current theories are right in terms of our philosophical understanding, if you like, of the universe and our knowledge of, of it? I mean, certainly it matters uh, a lot what these phenomena are and how uh, how we come about them. I mean, more, I think the most important part is that uh, we don't see nature or with the universe through these uh, theories in some sort of naked mathematical way revealed. Like these are uh, constructions that we have created over time based on our historical understanding of how to frame the problem in the first place. So we're building on initial choices that were made, initial models, and then we're trying to fill them in. So I mean, one of the challenges we face uh, in this is we don't know how far the validity of the current model in our own solar system actually extends into the universe. So one of the implications of MOND that I would, where does MOND, like variable gravity, for example, come into play? Like how far do you have to go out of our solar system before we could detect by Mond standards. Yes, I think the view people have is that quantum mechanics is about small things. Yeah. General relativity is about big things. Yeah. Big things are made of small things, so therefore the small things are the important things. Now I think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Quantum gravity is not the right answer. Okay. So I'm sticking my neck out here. Okay. <laughs> the right answer. There are two different. If you want to combine gravity and quantum mechanics, you have to worry at least as much about the effect of gravity on quantum mechanics yeah. as on the effect of quanta quantum mechanics on gravity. People think, oh, well, to understand a theory, probably you've got to quantize it eventually. Yeah. What I'm saying is that that isn't, it's part of the right answer, mm -hmm. but it's not the right answer. The right answer is that quantum mechanics needs help. Yes. You see, quantum mechanics has an internal, I call it an inconsistency. Yeah. The The people who worried about this most were Einstein, Schrodinger, and actually Dirac, the, mm -hmm. great, the three of the main figures yeah. in the subject. Um, and they all thought that quantum mechanics is incomplete, yes. or I would say even inconsistent, mm -hmm. because the way quantum mechanics works, and you'd have to go into the details of this, I don't know what to do here. Yes. <laughs> you, well, there's a thing called the Schrodinger equation, which tells you how a quantum system evolves in time. Yeah. And we have lots of evidence that said, yeah, it's right. However, it's not right, as Schrodinger himself knew. And he had this thought experiment of a Schrodinger's cat yes. to dra rather to demonstrate this. But if you follow his equation, you get nonsense. Yes. And that what you, to make sense of it, you have to have what's called the collapse of the wave function. Mm -hmm. that following the Schrodinger equation doesn't give you what the world does. Looks like, yeah, we don't see cats that are both dead and alive. We see them very determinately, one thing or the other. That's right. You see A or B rather than sort of A and B at once. Yeah. That sort of thing. And what is it that does that? Well, my view is it's gravity. Uh -huh. And that to fix quantum mechanics, which is this very problem, yeah. collapse of the wave function, you're going to have to bring gravity in. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to gravitize quantum mechanics as much as you quantize gravity. And right. in fact, gravitizing quantum mechanics is the important thing. Mm -hmm. That's all over the place. Whereas yeah. quantizing gravity, maybe it depends on the singularities and black holes and all that stuff. Yeah. But that's only a little tiny problem. Yeah. The main problem is how to make quantum mechanics work. We live in a complex, multi-dimensional landscape of risk. And what we're doing all the time is trying to optimize within this multi-dimensional landscape of risk um, to find this optimum, to, to try and live the richest, fullest you know, life possible, and also to discharge our responsibilities and to honor our social contracts as best we can within this very complicated architecture of risks.
Now, how do we do that? Obviously, we are not, or we do not actively see, us, see ourselves as sort of constantly engaging in some kind of dance of trial and error to, to reach that optimum, um, because some of these trade-offs have already been worked out for us by society and by ourselves, by the fact that we've lived lives. So we tend to follow a set of general guidelines and within which we try and accommodate our individual preferences and tolerances. But what seems to me that sometimes in this process and then this COVID incident has really crystallized for me that we lose sight of these trade-offs and of the social contract in which they're embedded. I mean, it's clear to me, David probably won't like this, that unregulated markets can certainly serve to distort perceptions of risk of a product or an activity um, and also promote expectations of a life without compromise, um, as I'm sure can um, as some sort of other authoritarian um, framework. But um, that's fundamentally what I think we should be, or that's got me thinking is, okay, I, you know, we, I think most of us have accepted that we live within this kind of really complicated system within which we're all con continuously refining and changing our ways of dealing with risk. Um, and obvious, but this whole COVID um, event has, has seems to have um, at least presents to me a picture of people who are not aware of the choices they're making every day. I mean, we live in close association with a multitude of microorganisms, some of which have the propensity to call, cause disease and kill us, particularly if we have no previous acquaintance with them. And managing this ecological relationship is a critical part of our lives and it requires very careful thought. And in my own work, mathematical models and statistical methodologies kind of help us determine the best course of action. Um, but we, what, what's really important is that we cannot act along a single dimension of minimizing risk um, towards a single pathogen. One thing to, to perhaps make clear to the audience is this is happening in everybody in this room because we had the pandemic that arrived with coronavirus. Now, of course, we've fortunately uh, developed vaccines uh, against the virus, and that's been our great saving uh, grace. But what would have happened anyway, with a lot of people dying, of course, would have been that our um, immune systems would have done exactly what we're describing. That is, they would have used that mechanism for hypermutating, that is, mutating extremely quickly to produce millions of new DNA sequences. And then that is used to be what then uh, gives you the immunity, the acquired immunity, obviously. Now, what Richard is questioning is, okay, maybe that can occasionally be passed to the germline, we don't know that yet, whether an immune response can be passed to the germline, and I would readily say we don't know that yet. But what is important is Richard's point about how temporary it is. Now, it's very important indeed, and I agree with Richard about the importance of temporariness or permanence, because it seems to me that what these mechanisms give is the option for the evolutionary process to, as it were, try it out. If there's an environmental change that makes it very difficult to survive and all organisms are under stress and they alter their genomes and pass some of that even temporarily on to the next generations, what the next generations can do is to find out whether they do experience that change in environment or not. If they don't, then it's great that it's temporary. You don't have to alter the main genome. If it is more or less permanent and goes on for many generations, then how can it get assimilated in the genome? Conrad Waddington showed how to do that way back in the 1950s. Incidentally, his book, The Strategy of the Genes, has been rightly republished in 2014. So you, you can buy it again. It was published in 1957. He did beautiful experiments on fruit flies. He induced changes with very tiny, gentle persuasion, as it were, from either heat or ether or some other um, experimental techniques in which he could, as it were, persuade a few of the fries to, f to show a new characteristic. 
and he actually determined how many generations would you have to continue to do that in order for it to become assimilated into the genome. It's about 14. It's not very long. Now, what he was showing is what he called genetic assimilation. I think it was a great mistake that Waddington was ignored by the evolutionary biologists, and that's a shame. 